Welcome, 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 everyone. I'm your host, Henry R. Slayton, and welcome to this episode of the Future of Money podcast. Before we start, I want to say a big thank you to the half million of you who follow my content each week. This, post, this podcast, The Future of Money, is now ranked in the top 5% of all podcasts globally on Spotify. Thousands of you from over 160 countries are tuning in each week. So massive thank you for all your support. As all you loyal listeners know, my goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto and hopefully empower you with this information and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of money and the future of finance. And to do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. My guest today is somebody I really like, I've known for a long time, Mr. Jahan Chu, who's the founder of Kinetic Capital, literally the first blockchain VC in Hong Kong and one of the earliest in Asia who's accepted to join us today. Uh, Jan, a big welcome to the show uh, and welcome to the Future of Money podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Henry. Great to be here. Excited to uh, always One thing, by the way, people may not know about Jahan, by the way, is he started an arts world. Uh, you know, I initially started with Sotheby's. So again, a big correlation there. We'll talk about NFTs as well uh, from, from that perspective and talk all about it as well. Uh, Jahan, as we kick off, um, can you maybe, before we talk about the show, can you maybe share a bit more about yourself, Kinetic, uh, but also about your personal background, which is super exciting? Sure. So... Uh, I actually started off as a front end developer. I was a coder in, in, high, uh, in, in college uh, and I started off at basically an internet startup uh, in the kind of tail end of the first dot com boom. Um, I was doing work on the side and I got hired by Sotheby's to basically freelance Sotheby's auction house in New York, the, the storied, you know, kind of auction house. And we sold the uh, Declaration of Independence, one of the last remaining copies in private hands um, online. Uh, back, I think it was like $7 million, which was crazy to sell something that expensive, you know, online. Uh, unfortunately, the it was too early for that type of market. And Sotheby's CEO at the time went to jail for collusion. So <laughs> it was a it was a fun time, you know, kind of not dissimilar to some of the stuff we're seeing in crypto now. Um, history repeating itself. Uh, and yeah, I basically was a coder. I, you know, was at Sotheby's for a long time. They moved into Hong Kong. I left and became an art dealer, got super deep into the art world, uh, getting involved in the nonprofit space. Uh, and then around 2013, I got really into Bitcoin. I just fell into the drab, fell down the rabbit hole, uh, was kind of eating, sleeping, breathing, drinking uh, crypto uh, in the kind of 2013, 2014 era, started the Ethereum community. Um, and started Kinetic in 2016. We've invested in over, you know, probably nearly 275 companies, um, some of the largest early stage kind of protocols, um, you know, everything from unicorns, multicorns, deck, we even have a decacorn uh, in our portfolio. Uh, but mostly we're just excited to have the opportunity to back so many of the, the really early great founders in the space. And hopefully we're, we're kind of continuing to do that now. Uh, we incubate companies. We also uh, run a couple of funds, but we're actually a family office ourselves. So uh, we're excited just to kind of be able to do the, the fun things in crypto that we want to do. It's amazing, John. I think for the benefit of our audience, I think it's, uh, you're a very humble guy, but I think it's, it's uh, the, the, I think the role, the impact you've had as somebody who was in Asia at a time uh, on the growth of the crypto community, not only in Asia, by the way, but globally. I remember when you used to host uh, Vitalik in some of these first meetings. Uh, I remember they used to call him VB in China and his first uh, trips he used to do, uh, the first meetups. I remember the first time I heard about Ethereum was a meetup that you organized. I will never forget that it was in Wan Chai in Hong Kong in one of these uh, shared office spaces. I, you know, before we start recording this, I was going through this uh, book. Uh, I think for those of you watching this on YouTube, you can see there's a book called The Block Kong about the people who built the crypto community in Asia. Uh, Jan, obviously, you're featured in there. So am I ironic, I just see next to me is uh, SBF in the picture, which uh, I think one day our kids are going to ask us about this. Uh, but uh, I think, Jan, you really I think, thank you for all the contribution you've done. Uh, to the crypto community, I have to even personally, I still remember when I when I was able to make crypto as a profession was in part uh, due to you. So uh, I think you played a big role in many people's lives uh, over the years. Uh, so John, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. You know, this this episode is part of our investor series. So uh, where we had uh, we we had uh, on the show uh, crypto hedge fund managers. Uh, you know how people are looking at investing. And this episode, I really want to focus on um, VC investing, equity investing, and also some tokens as well. Uh, and maybe the idea is like share with our audience 
uh, you know, uh, what are the things you're looking for, right? And I want to kick it off actually with that, with that, with that topic because obviously we're in a bear market, depending how you look at it. Um, and you guys have been continuing to invest uh, in this bear market. What is you think the opportunity? What are the opportunities as a VC investor? in a bear market? And do you believe like what other VCs are saying that 2023 may be the best vintage that we may see in, in many years? Yeah, I, it's an important question uh, because, you know, your perspective can change when money is everywhere and, you know, kind of everything seems like up and to the right. Uh, and, you know, in the past year or so, when things feel like there's maybe no hope, maybe no future for crypto and, and everything seems, you know, just helpless or hopeless a little bit. Um, it's really those times. And, and, you know, this, I'm not the first or the last person to say this. That's really where I think VCs are, are really tested because when there's no money, when there's no excitement, when everything seems, you know, difficult, you really have to stick by your first principles in terms of investing and, and what you really believe um, to be true about the space. And I think that's really what separates a lot of the long-term blockchain and crypto investors uh, from the ones who are coming in, because when you've held these kind of values about decentralization, uh, about the kind of value of blockchain and the types of benefits that it, it can, uh, you know, kind of add to technology, to society, to, uh, you know, government and to finance, when you've gone through a couple of, you know, down cycles where your core beliefs are both tested and reaffirmed over time and over cycles, that's really where I think, um, you know, the, the almost like the, the lighthouse that, that kind of leads us through these storms. So I would say, what do we look for? Uh, we look for the same types of things that we look for from the very beginning. Obviously, strong team. Uh, obviously, a an area where we believe that the technology of blockchain, whether it's crypto or non-crypto, uh, whether it's fully decentralized or even permissioned or semi-decentralized, where it actually adds value, where you're providing a service which is better than the service that came before it, that people will pay for. And that's the real operative, I think, difference going from cycle to cycle. Um, three cycles in, there's no more hiding behind, well, eventually, there has to be, this provides value now, and so-and-so will pay money for this. There's no more hand-waving, there's no more kind of obfuscation about, you know, kind of token economics. There must be results. There must be value. And it must be something people, customers can both understand and are willing to pay for. And I think that's what really um, the, the kind of difference between how we used to invest in 2017, uh, 2020, uh, and now. There's so much more uh, emphasis on uh, real world utility, real world value. So actually, on this point, so you mentioned real-world utility, real-world uh, value. In what verticals of VC investing are you seeing these real-world utility and value uh, when you look at the landscape right now? I have to say, it, unfortunately, it's not as in, in as many places as I would have liked. Um, I think, you know, what are we, like 13 years out um, from, you know, since the creation of kind of Bitcoin, I would have hoped that we would have seen a lot more real-world use cases. But I think that the areas that are undeniably making a, an, a short-term and long-term impact are digital assets. Uh, digital assets meaning NFTs, uh, and I don't mean you know the the kind of PFP projects that you know kind of and hype cycles and all this kind of stuff. I mean things that actually uh, retail users like Starbucks, like Nike, like LVMH are not only experimenting with but doubling down and expanding the scope uh, and extent of how they're actually using these technologies. Everything from loyalty um, to gamification to experiential uh, to digital and physical twins, they're really pushing uh, the, the boundaries of what mainstream can accept. And that's where I think it's very different. The last couple of years before this, it was mostly just crypto people talking to crypto people doing crypto things, which is great, but it's a small market. The real difference is that you have the lo world's largest companies who are putting a stake in the ground and saying, we think that this has potential and we're going to develop that potential because we think it adds to our bottom line. It's no more, well, this is a POC, this is a marketing thing. It's actually fundamental type of future-proofing their business, whether it's digital uh, kind of assets, digital goods, digital wearables, or ways to increase and improve the relationship with their customers. That's super exciting. So when you mention about NFTs here, right? Actually, 
uh, in parenthesis, I just remember you organized, this was, I don't know what year, but one of the first NFT conferences, I remember you used to call it NFTs at a time. Yeah, uh, it was 2018. I, here we go. I, I don't know when the name changed from NFTs to NFTs, but... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that was, to be honest, that was the first NFT conference in the world. Uh, it was myself and uh, Ari Milik, who was the founder of Decentraland, and... It came about, I, I literally, it was 2 a.m. I had just read an article. I was going to sleep. I read an article about Decentraland and something. Uh, and I was like, Ari, because we're investors in Decentraland. Why is there an NFT conference? And he said, let's do it. He didn't even hesitate. He said, let's do it. And so we did it. Uh, that was, that was. I think we had 800 people came. And it was, you know, Animoca and Super Rare and OpenSea. Everybody came. It's, it was a fundamental thing. Uh, and Nifty uh, was the name of the conference, but the name of the asset was always NFT. So it was just a play on words. I remember that. It was, uh, again, I think when you're saying that the, the outsized role you played, uh, Jan, on that perspective, is all coming on, let's take on the topic of NFTs, right? Obviously, there's been the whole hoopla hoopla of, you know, from uh, PFPs to other NFTs that have been happening over the last uh, couple of years. So obviously, you mentioned that you're looking at cases where there's digital assets can play a real role for real companies, right? How do you look at it? Like, what is, you think, the next step when we look at NFTs? Is it companies using NFTs as part of day-to-day -day activities? Or do you believe, again, especially coming from your arts background, the artistic element will always play a role in the development of NFTs? I think NFTs really need to be thought of not as a piece of content, but as a capsule. It needs to be thought of as a container. Uh, it's basically a code-based container that you can put anything into. The early experiments have been all about design and art and, you know, kind of um, uh, other types of experiments, mostly, you know, could be literature or, or music, but anything can go in there. And it's in the future, I think that NFTs and these digital containers will contain everything from financial data to user data. We invested in a company called Snickerdoodle, which is using NFTs for user data to replace cookies. I think that, you know, with these types of decentralized profiles in the Web3 world and, you know, things like WorldCoin, which is a, another one of our, uh, you know, by Sam Altman and one of our portfolio companies, it creates a need for a more exact, more precise, uh, more flexible uh, and more secure type of user profile online where you can store my preferences, my social security number, my, you know, credit score, my shopping preferences at, you know, whatever mall, all of these things need to be accessible in a way which is both transparent, potentially incentivized, um, and also, uh, you know, kind of natively digital. And that is the definition of an NFT. So I think that this is just the first, you know, appetizer, you know, kind of these, these JPEG NFTs. The real game and the real, you know, kind of battleground will be how industrial and enterprise and finance will use NFTs to create very flexible, very on-chain, very dynamic, even AI-driven uh, and incentivized models for how to access data, whether it's, you know, from your company, whether it's from your personal or anything. That is actually the data landscape of the future. It's actually all NFTs. You just mentioned that Worldcoin. I cannot, I cannot uh, not ask you a question about it. Obviously, from what you mentioned, you, you're an investor in Worldcoin. What is your view on it? Obviously, since it launched a couple of weeks ago, there was a lot of negative criticism from countries taking certain action to a lot of privacy concerns. By the way, not only uh, inside the crypto community, but uh, also outside as well. As an investor and as somebody who sees the big picture, what is your view on it, on Worldcoin and the imp impact it can have on the development of Web3? I think WorldCoin is probably one of the most um, important kind of innovations in you know the recent history of blockchain, um, and I think it's actually also true for AI. We cannot underestimate how important what WorldCoin is doing is. Now, I'm not saying that it's the end-all, be-all, silver bullet solution, but it absolutely is a starting gun to the next phase, the next generation of technology. The reason why I say this is, and, and the analogy I would give is, is basically like, you know, the, the automobile versus, you know, the horse and buggy. It was dangerous. People didn't understand why we needed it. Um, there were no rules. Uh, but as obviously we've seen in the past hundred years, automotive transportation has completely transformed the fabric of society. It's basically been literally an engine for growth and a, uh, the, the ability to actually connect an entire continent um, and infrastructure and enabled, you know, kind of development. That's what WorldCoin is, basically. 
it is an engine and a platform and a foundation. It won't be the only one, but the ability to actually, uh, in a world of AI and in a world of deep fakes and in a world of all of these types of threats, the ability to tie data back to its author and prove from a human perspective that it came from Henry, that it came from Jahan, that is incredibly, incredibly important because AI has basically exponentially increased the amount of data that we will all be producing, consuming, transacting, et cetera. And we need to know where it comes from. And at the end of the day, we need to be able to prove that it's us, us flesh, you know, kind of blood and bones, humans, us. It also is important for other things like, you know, well, it came from my organization, but WorldCoin and the concept behind it are the foundations for that type of next generation uh, attribution uh, and provable, verifiable data. It's truth in a little orb. And, and I, especially, I think, what it, as, as you mentioned, the world of AI coming together, what it holds this entire ecosystem of Web3, uh, it's going to be very interesting. I think uh, definitely I agree with you. WorldCoin is going to be one of the big developments to watch over the next couple of months and years. Uh, it's funny, you, the, the horse example is the one I use a lot when I give my keynotes of all the criticism we had back in the day uh, in that perspective. Uh, Jen, I want to touch upon one thing you mentioned a couple of minutes ago on, on the central line, but also the broader metaverse ecosystems. Uh, as an investor, how do, you, how do you look at metaverse ecosystems right now, uh, whether it's decentralized ones or a centralized one? And what do you think is the future landscape over the next couple of years of these metaverse ecosystems? Yeah, metaverse is a tough one. I think that we're still a bit early for, for kind of true articulated metaverse. And we know this because there isn't a good one. Um, but I think that the, the analogy for metaverse is similar to the analogy for generative AI. Generative AI was around for a long time. And it wasn't until you know, OpenAI's latest, you know, version cracked the code in terms of uh, making it accessible and understandable to average people um, and useful to average people on a daily basis. Like you can answer questions. That is when people really started to accelerate their usage. And I think that we're going to see the same thing with Metaverse. It's probably not tomorrow, maybe not even next year, maybe not even the next like three to five years. But it's very clear that metaverse will find um, a it's kind of you know product market fit it's killer use case and it's you know kind of role model example i think that before that we will see a you know killer use case in ar in augmented reality and something that i like to call the aug metaverse which i think will precede uh, will it will, will be successful before the metaverse we see examples of this obviously with you know apple's headset um, even in the blockchain and the Web3 world with one of our portfolio companies, uh, Alki Labs out of, out of Hong Kong, actually. Um, these types of things, whether it's something simple like, you know, how do I use uh, my phone uh, to basically map the physical world and layer on another augmented reality uh, information layer or value layer or social layer. Imagine you can walk around Hong Kong or Armenia and you can see tags that your friends left just by doing for your phone, no headset needed. And you can see tags that say, hey, Henry, I left the keys under this rock. Nobody else can see that except for you. And it's an AR layer. These types of very useful things are um, helpful in an industrial setting, uh, in a personal setting, uh, and even in a kind of a governmental setting. And I think we're not that far away. But the actual pure metaverse, the, the, the Decentralands, the sandboxes, the, the, the horizons from, from meta itself, I think it's still pretty far away because there's just not you know, a need for it. Uh, but again, there's never a need until there is. And then suddenly, oh, wow, everybody needs ChatGPT now. Uh, you know, we're transforming the world. And three months ago, we weren't, but now we are. So that will be what the metaverse will happen. And, and who's who's to say when? when? Yeah, that's a good point. I think also with ChatGPT, they're going through the same hype cycle that we went through crypto a couple of years ago, huh? where everybody's a crypto company. Now everybody's an AI company uh, or Chad G using ChatGPT in whatever business they're in. Uh, which brings me to a point on valuations, Jahan. Obviously, you've invested in numerous crypto cycles. What's your view on where valuations are now for crypto companies uh, generally that you're seeing in the market? Yeah, it's it's a difficult one because we see, I just came from ETHCC, which is the Ethereum conference in Paris. Um, we see rounds that are oversubscribed, people, you know, kind of beating at the door and, you know, uh, scheming to get in. And we see companies that can't raise, um, you know, great teams with strong ideas uh, who just aren't able to raise. It's a very confusing type of environment right now. It lurches back and forth between feast and famine. 
um, just kind of depending on, you know, what week it is and what the narrative is. I mean, interest rates, you know, seems like interest rates aren't going up anymore. And suddenly, you know, there's there's money galore and people are throwing, you know, money at the next, you know, kind of decentralized perps protocol in, in, in DeFi. Um, and then, you know, somebody says something else uh, and, and then suddenly, you know, hey, we're we got to take it slow. We're being extremely picky. So um, it's inconsistent. I would say that overall it's slower. I know a lot of big venture, you know, blockchain uh, firms like um, who have pulled back, who are doing apology tours for kind of poor results. Obviously, we've seen kind of Sequoia cut back its own crypto uh, fund by, by almost more than half. Um, so it's, it's a tough environment. Uh, I think what we need is a new narrative uh, in blockchain and crypto. And I think that AI may be one of those narratives. Um, obviously, the ETF, uh, this, the kind of eventual ETF is, is a new narrative. Um, I think that Elon may surprise us with something around Doge and X. Um, I think that provides you know, a lot of fuel. But all of these are just kind of speculative types of you know mindshare um, waves like what like I said before what we really need is real world utility uh, real world real world value and you know regardless of whether it's blockchain or crypto or kind of permissioned ledgers whatever it needs to provide value and it needs to do it soon what are the red flags you mentioned obviously for some companies it's easier to raise for others it's more difficult if you had a piece of advice to give to entrepreneurs or pitching their business, what is the biggest mistake you see crypto entrepreneurs do when they're pitching their business to VCs? And second, what are the red flags you're looking for? Um, I think the, the important thing for new founders, for first time founders to, to remember is, is that you have to be passionate, which is, you know, kind of a, you have to be passionate and really believe in what you're doing. But I think especially now, you need to speak a language which um, understands the context of, of where we are in the crypto market, which is there needs to be real value. And even if you as a founder don't think that you can get there in the first year, that's fine. Say it, acknowledge it, let the investor know that you understand, you know, what is and what isn't. And we're not having any kind of hand wave. We're not having any kind of illusions about, you know, well, the tokenomics will catch up. Uh, they won't actually like there must be users and those users must pay. And that's how business works. Um, it's very important for first time founders and, and even, you know, second time, third time founders to go back to first principles and explain the value and the uh, kind of benefit of their application in those terms. Got to start from the beginning and draw the line all the way to the end. Who's going to pay for this and why and why is it better than anything else? It can't be, you know, well, because we're going to have network effect, which is going to, you know, kind of cause our token to go up. Like that's no longer acceptable. That's no longer fundable. Um, and, you know, we want founders who can basically bridge the crypto world into the real world. Uh, and I think the more that a founder can express that they both understand and have a plan for where their market is going to be, who is going to be their customer and how are they going to get there? Um, if they can articulate that, then I think they have a really strong uh, kind of chance. And it's it's literally a way to differentiate yourself from you know, the, the legions uh, of kind of crypto founders out there who are just, you know, kind of also rands and, you know, doing the next, you know, kind of copycat DEX protocol or DEX aggregator or whatever. And it's, it's just not interesting and not fundable. And where do you see the, the global trend coming in? For example, you spend a lot of time in Asia. You're, you're in uh, Puerto Rico right now. There's obviously, and you're in Paris uh, recently. I mean, there's a lot of activity. You're seeing crypto markets globally. Do you think the recent events that we've seen in the United States are having an impact, one, on new crypto startups, but second, on crypto VC funding? I know there's a lot of, it impacts a lot of public investments in crypto, on the, but on the VC angle of crypto, do you think the events are impacting it as well? Um, there's a lot of buzz around Hong Kong, obviously, uh, because of the, the stance that the, that the Hong Kong government has taken to try to be more welcoming and, and the implications for what that means for, you know, kind of mainland China's view towards crypto and potentially positioning Hong Kong as, as, um, as maybe an Asian oasis. Um, I'm slightly kind of more skeptical. Uh, I always feel like the Hong Kong government is our risk managers, not risk takers. Um, and I think that things will proceed more slowly and more conservatively than, than we think. 
Um, already I've seen, you know, kind of feedback from some of the banks that despite all the kind of hoopla, they're actually not really banking and not so eager to bank crypto companies yet. Um, despite the Hong Kong government publicly, you know, kind of encouraging them to. Um, so what is said and what is done, I think, are two very different things. Um, and we'll know within, I would say, six months is a reasonable time to expect actual change and actual results. Um, and if not within that period, then we should expect kind of nothing more than what we had before, which is uh, a lot of talk and, and very little meaningful uh, kind of haven for kind of crypto as a business and, and really just kind of more institutional um, you kind of go around. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, what, what we can expect. Middle East is super exciting. There's money there. There's excitement. I think there's a real, um, existential understanding of what digital asset trade and market will be and how important it is for, um, uh, an economy and a region, which must change. It's kind of, um, you know, revenue base from, you know, fossil fuels to, you know, digital oil. Uh, in a sense, which is data, which is AI, which is crypto and, and underpinned by crypto. So I'm excited about Middle East. Um, I think Europe is starting to wake up, maybe just because I was there, you know, it's a, and it's summer. But, but I feel like Europe is starting to wake up. Um, there seems to be more sensible regulation. There seems to be an, an, an interest in, you know, where a lot of European companies like French, uh, English and, and, you know, kind of Eastern European blockchain companies who are, who are doing pretty exciting things. So I'm excited for that, too. I think LATAM is probably a little bit of, you know, a, dis a, a disappointment in terms of, I thought, you know, in a few years ago, it would be a bigger player by now, but it hasn't been. I think Africa is still very, very far behind. Um, and then the US is, is the big question, right? It's, it's the 800 pound gorilla who can't decide where they want to sit. Um, you know, they will just have to see what the next administration brings. Um, so yeah, my money is on the Middle East um, as the actual kind of you know, driver, uh, and then pockets of Asia. I do think that China, ironically, will be, you know, as always, I've said this before, and you, you know, I'm a big fan of the BSN and what's happening with China's one of China's national blockchain infrastructure protocols, I, I think that they're going to be a driver of non crypto. And the whole narrative of non crypto blockchain ecosystems um, will be as big, if not bigger than cryptocurrency powered blockchain ecosystems, because I think that most altcoins go away. And what we're left with, there's CBDCs, stable coins, real world asset tokens, security tokens, uh, and NFTs. Uh, and a lot of the governance, gas tokens, altcoins will probably fade away for, for lack of actual use and actual demand. Um, and so I, I think that's where China, you know, does have a role to play um, in a non-cryptocurrency environment. And you don't think even the recent... Uh indications from a Chinese government, again, they're all related to blockchain or digital assets, excluding, I guess, crypto, decentralized cryptocurrencies, I presume that's your view, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there is no crypto in, in China, there will be no crypto in China. Um, but there are there will be digital assets. Um, I think NFTs, metaverse, digital goods will be huge. I think that they will probably dominate uh, the next generation of digital asset trade. I think that China will probably, you know, to a, to a certain extent, be the center of, of that market. Um, certainly they have the capacity and, and, the, and the potential to. Um, yeah, we'll see though. It's interesting, I think, because we think we both saw the, the rise of Hong Kong back in the day where pretty much a lot of these leading companies were created there. And uh, due to some issues, including banks, by the way, I'm so disappointed and I've been very public about this over the years. I mean, I think that some of the Hong Kong banks were responsible directly of the bankruptcy of many crypto companies we've seen with cutting their bank accounts. And it's interesting what you mentioned about the Middle East, uh, Jahan, obviously a number of people, including myself, you know, we relocated ourselves to Dubai to the point that we literally have chat groups of the crypto folks in Hong Kong. Remember the fintech aficionados group now in Dubai, right? So it's become actually very interesting uh, 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 wave now what's happening across the Middle East, obviously with Dubai, Abu Dhabi, but also other new markets up in the region opening it up uh, as well. Uh, Jen, this is super interesting. John, I'm going to finish it off with my regular fire bell of questions. You've been on stage with me. My best friend, the bell, is here with me. Uh, so I'm going to ask quick questions that I want a one or two word answer. Uh, sure. And I want to hear from that perspective. Are you ready? Yeah. Here we go. The bell is here to keep us honest. Jen, um, you spent a lot of time in Hong Kong. What's your favorite thing about Hong Kong? The food. Here we go. Uh, favorite restaurant in Hong Kong? I love Golden Valley for kind of classical kind of Chinese food. Here we go. A free advertisement for this great uh, Hong Kong eatery. Uh, you spend also a lot of time in Puerto Rico. What's the one thing people get wrong about Puerto Rico? It's more beautiful 
and tranquil than people think. What's exciting you the most about the future of crypto? How it's starting to disappear and become a little bit more of the fabric underneath rather than the icing on the cake. Yeah, very interesting. A lot of parallels there with the internet as well, like with protocols and uh, stuff like that. Uh, you've met a lot of people in crypto over the years. What is the most uh, uh, impressive individual you met over the years in the crypto ecosystem? Uh, too many. I, I, I would have to say Vitalik, though, because I have a you know personal relationship over the, over the past few years. Um, I, I think that it's there are very f few p opportunities in life to meet someone who is so evolved and has such integrity and brilliance all at the same time, um, especially one who has so much, you know, potential. It, it's really like we're looking at not even the next Elon. We're, we're looking at something ev even more mythical in a way. Yeah. I have to say, I still remember those early gatherings uh, you used to organize with him. If they you were a betting man... Exactly. If you're a betting man, Jahan, uh, who do you think is Satoshi? A man, a woman, and or, or or whatever? And where where is he or she from? Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure it's a collective. I don't have any additional information, but I think it's probably a collective of. I would say it's maybe four to six people. I think beyond that, it'd be hard to keep it, um, you know, as much of a secret as as it has been. I think they're quite international. Definitely some, you know, kind of, um, I would say there's at least one American in there, but actually surprisingly, probably more international than we think. Unfortunately, there's probably not any women in it, which I, I think is a shame, but hey, maybe Satoshi 2.0. <laughs> uh, Jan, uh, Elon Musk gives you a call and says, what's the advice you have for him for X and what he can do with the platform? What's your one piece of advice for Elon? Do good. <laughs> Uh, you've met many NFT artists over the years. What is your favorite NFT artist? And what is your favorite traditional art artist? I I represent a few artists in the NFT space, so I, so as not to exclude any of them because I love all of them. Uh, I would say Beeple, in no particular order, Beeple, Rafiq, Josh Davis, Ash Thorpe, Craig Mullins, they're all impressive and um, important pieces of history to collect. What about traditional art? Your favorite, from your background of Sotheby's, what is your favorite traditional non-crypto and non-NFT artist? My favorite painter is a Hong Kong painter named Chris Hyun, H-U-E-N. I've been collecting his work forever uh, since his graduate show. Um, he is incredible, poetic, um, kind of infinitely viewable. You can just keep watching it forever. Um, and then otherwise, out of that side of that, there's a Japanese artist named Shinro Otake, uh, who is incredible and historical and, and very, very uh, impressive. So Jan Chu, the founder of Kinetic Capital. Jan, the traditional question on the Future of Money podcast. If you could have lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person dead or alive, who, do you, who would you have lunch or dinner with? My dad. <laughs> what a good answer. Jan, it was great to have you on the show. Jan, if people want to find out more about you, get in touch, how, what's the best way? Or follow your work. You can find me on, on Twitter at, at collectionist, C O L L E C T I U N I S T, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also find me on uh, Twitter at Jahan Chu, first name, last name, but that just points to collectionist. Here we go. So, Jan, thank you very much, everybody. I hope this was an insightful show on talking about the VC angle, also bring the Asia angle, the NFTs. We touch a lot of topics. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being with us. If you like the show, give us a five star rating. It really helps more people discover the show. And by the way, make sure to check out my YouTube page where I have a lot of exclusive content, content at Henry R. Slingin, a lot of content in multiple languages as well. Uh, Jan, it was great having you. And thank you, everybody at home, for listening. And see you soon for another episode of the Future Money Podcast. See you guys soon. <laughs>